Hello, everyone, and welcome to AWS for Games Partner Profiles, where we interview AWS game technology partners, break down their offerings, and help you jumpstart your cloud game development journey. My name is Chris Melisinos, and I'm the principal evangelist for video games at AWS. And on today's program, I sit down with co-founder and CEO of Beamable, John Radoff, to discuss an important area of game development, deployment, and management, most often referred to as live ops services. We'll discuss who Beamable is, what they offer, and how they are making it easier for game developers to develop for, integrate with, and leverage these powerful tools to improve the management, growth, and overall experience for your players. So let's get started by welcoming John to the program. Hey, John, welcome to the program. Hey, Chris, how are you? Thanks for having me. Great, man. Great. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you here today. So, you know, please introduce yourself to our audience and tell me briefly about your history kind of in the games industry, right? Because the tools you've created at Beamable for game developers are driven from your experience as a game developer. So share a little bit of your history with us. So I, I spent most of my life building games, going all the way back to really even being a kid. I, I was making online games as a teenager for bulletin board systems and then launched one of the first commercial internet-based games called Legends of Future Past. But more recently, shipped games to about 20 million players, all based on entertainment worlds that we're all familiar with. So Game of Thrones, Star Trek. Star Trek game is called Star Trek Timeline, still runs today. So mm -hmm. those are the games I've built, but I also kind of crammed in between a few of these um, game businesses that I built. I also got involved in enterprise technology and data analytics and, and a lot of other online technologies. So about three, four years ago, I realized uh, that I had this unique set of experiences, both building games, but also scaling technology and building platforms. And I should kind of smush that together so I could help thousands of people build games better because I had noticed a heck of a lot of problems with building games, especially online games and virtual worlds. And that's what we help with. So that's me. Uh, Beamable is a development platform for virtual worlds and online games. Oh, that's amazing. So basically, these are the tools that you developed in building games for yourself that you felt would be valuable to anybody looking to build online games and actually operate kind of their live ops for games. A lot of the technology was, in fact, derived from tech from stuff that we built back at Disruptor Beam, my game studio. Um, that said, I'll, I'll, I'll say this about that, though. I think a lot of game studios have the dream of like, they've created some really cool technologies. A lot of game studios have, have built really interesting technologies and then take that technology out to the world. But it's never that easy productizing, packaging it, documenting it, really turning it into a product that addresses a marketplace. I had kind of knew what I was getting into because I built products like that other besides building games. Um, it's a, it's quite an undertaking. I mean, that took us a couple of years to get from just like pure technology line of code type stuff and turning it into something that any game studio could just boot up and start using from day zero. But yes, it did find its origin in a lot of the problems that we solved building games for millions and millions of users that had to scale out, but also just kind of creating the whole authoring and workflow environment so that it's productive to use within a game studio, which to me, that's the big problem that a lot of people encounter when adopting technologies for their game studio. So John, when we think about live ops, you know, how would you define what live ops are and why does a game developer need to really consider this at the beginning of their development journey? Well, the, the key word, I guess, is live. And it the word ops is confusing because it gets blended together with DevOps and all these ops things that we have. Right. But actually, those things exist in, in a continuum. DevOps is more about the developers putting code and content and flowing it into the live production environment of the game. Live ops, usually the way people think about that is how you manage and tweak things on a day-to-day -day basis and respond to customers, learn from them, do customer support, look at dashboards and KPIs of, of what's happening in your game. So 
you know, if I, I'll, I'll tell maybe a little bit of a story around it to, to bring it into perspective, but yeah. where, where I kind of cut my teeth on this was when we launched a, a game called Game of Thrones Ascent. And Game of Thrones Ascent was a really interesting game in that it was one of the earliest mobile games that used IP. Game of Thrones was, we didn't actually know Game of Thrones was going to be huge when we made this game. And then Game of Thrones launched and everybody loved it. Um, but it had this unique aspect of every time an episode came out, we had to have new content in the game on a weekly basis. So the, the episode would air, the game would have new items, stories, materials in it that are directly relevant to the viewing experience. So we really mm-hmm. wanted to connect this weekly flow of story back to the game itself. That meant we had to have a number one, an authoring pipeline that was really easy to use because the developers the game designers needed to be able to create content such as items that they might've just seen in an episode and make sure that the day after the episode aired, the items already in the game. But then the item gets in the game, you have to be able to look at that, see who's buying it, who's winning it, if it's part of sort of a reward package and a leaderboard. So you're now touching your players. Your players are enjoying the game they're consuming content, they're winning items, they're buying items, and you want to see what's engaging, what's retaining, what are the KPIs. That's the continuum of live ops is this process of creating and then learning, interacting with your customers and using that as part of a continuous improvement cycle for your game to, 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 to build a better and better game over time for your whole community. Yeah, so live ops basically is all of the framework around updating content, creating caring for the community, kind of communication back, and it's all of the things that modern online games require to manage be outside of just the core gameplay itself. It's all of those things, including authentication and transactions and all of the these sorts of things, which can be really complex, right? A lot of game developers, you know, chose to get into game development to make art and tell stories and build these things, not necessarily to become an expert in cloud-based services or building those types of tools. So Beamable makes it easier for anybody looking to build their games, provide those types of services online. You provide the framework and kind of all the back end rigging and hooking together with these things so they don't have to. You asked a really important question a moment ago, which is basically when should you start thinking about this in your game development process? And it used to be before something like a Beamable existed, you'd just sort of cobble things together as you went, and then you'd be like in soft launch for your game. And you're like, John, you just described the entire continuum of game development, right? I have got a need. I need to go fix it. We're going to slap this piece of code in there and we'll go fix it later, right? Yeah, I get it. And and being a game developer that you just, I described my life as sure. well. And, and we're all kind of hackers and tinkerers and, and we love building things and figuring things out. But building a live online service game today is so complicated that you can easily get caught up in just that. And it's, it, I liken it to the 3D engine world, right? So it used to be that you just build your own 3D engine from the ground up. You'd learn the DirectX APIs and you'd start building it. And what would you now have to do? You'd have to create your whole authoring pipeline, your Mm -hmm. toolkit to create content. You'd have to figure out how to interfit, either build your own physics system or incorporate some kind of physics API. And then there wasn't any like marketplace of components you could just plug in to solve a problem. You basically just have to figure it out all yourself. So that has been the problem with live services is the lack of like plug and play, scriptability, extensibility. That That's what we're trying to bring to the picture because there's so much you have to do in game development that you have to just increase your velocity for the features the player is going to care about. And you're going to try a lot of different things. Right? Like the Star Trek game that I mentioned earlier, like we built basically five different games before we landed on the game formula that really, really worked for the Star Trek audience. And we needed to move quickly through all of these different game prototypes. A lot of the early prototyping, it's really not enough anymore to just to sort of have 
paper prototyping alone for something as sophisticated as an online game where there's going to be all these social and online interactions, you kind of need to get it to a certain level of playability. So it actually starts with the rapid prototyping of your game from the earliest days. Like there shouldn't be any impediment to multiplayer or social interactions or economic interactions in your game. You should be able to play with that just like any other game mechanic, not like kick it, kick that can down the road for months and months before you discover that. But also it's a technology decision. Building on the right infrastructure from the beginning of your game increases the velocity through every stage, rapid prototyping, the rollout into soft launch. Certainly when you're in live ops, and you're actually reacting to customer issues. We think that a lot of developer, we see a lot of developers that used to think of live ops as the thing you start solving for as you were getting close to launch. And then what they would do is they would try to retrofit a zillion different systems. And right. it's just too late by then. You've already accumulated so much technical debt that you're probably going to have to live with all the decisions you made much earlier when you didn't even realize you were truly making decisions that you're going to have to stick with. So we want to get people started from day one with the right data architecture, the right scalability architecture, so that from the very beginning, their velocity is going to be at maximum and they'll be able to iterate and try things. And we see people just basically, you choose your 3D engine, then the next decision you should be making is, DevOps, live ops architecture so that now your team is just unleashed to be super creative and, and build stuff that players really love. That's excellent advice, right? So make sure that from the beginning of your development that you are considering what those types of services will be required at the end. So you can start baking those into your development pipeline from the beginning and make sure you have good solid integration throughout the development life cycle. Yeah, don't hem yourself in by just sort of doing the build as you go, build up technical debt along the way, because that technical debt becomes such a constraint yeah. once you're True. months into your development process. So John, so basically the advice that you give to any developer is to think about live ops from the beginning of their development process. So that way they can integrate those, those tools and services into their development process. So when it comes time to launch, they don't have that mounted technical debt and the launch can be that much smoother and service their customers more effectively. Yes, that's right. Day zero or day one kind of decision for your game. Awesome. Who is Beamable? What do they provide to game developers today? Great question. So let, let's just start with the mess that online game development is. So. If you look at this slide, it, it gives you a sense of the many pieces that occupy the, the online space of any online game. Not too different than the way 3D engines looked years ago. 3D engines are a lot easier to use now. Why? Because there's a script language, they're composable, the pieces work with each other, you know, the Lego blocks stick to each other instead of having to figure out how do you how you attach all these things together. Um, and then they were able to build marketplaces around it to expand upon the capabilities because of the standardization of those interfaces. So that's what we're trying to bring to the world of online game development. So if you think about all of the data that you have to deal with, it really starts there. So players, inventories, social graphs, the economies for games, and then how you establish cloud code around that to define your own specific rules, customize the live environment, and then wrap around that the whole DevOps process, the workflow. So how do we get things off of the developer's individual workstation, how to allow them to actually test and recreate the entire live environment on their development workstation, and then push a button and move it into staging and testing and ultimately the live production environment with not only the code that they're working on, but all those data objects, the inventories, the structure of the economy, the content, so to speak, of, of their game. So what we exist to solve for is taking all of this complexity, all of this complication of the backend environment, and just bring a lot of sanity to it. And that's what Beamable does. So we create a workflow around it. We give you a consistent data persistence layer that allows all these objects and systems to communicate with each other, to implement 
all of the metagame, all of the stuff that defines the way your game is going to work online. Okay, John, so help us understand how Beamable is going to help simplify all of that complexity for game developers that want to deploy live ops services. Cool. So we've got all that complexity, but it really breaks down into three big sections of the product. So at the highest level, there's what we call the live ops portal. So the live ops portal is where your product managers and game designers and customer support people, anybody who actually deals with the live aspects of the game, they log into that to look at dashboards, see how your game is doing, schedule content, look at a player's account, operate events, see what's going on in the leaderboards. Like all of the operational aspects of your game are managed there. At the opposite extreme of that, there's the live services SDK. So all of your game developers who are building in either Unity or Unreal, we have an SDK for that, which fits right into the IDEs that they use. So if you're, for example, using the Unity editor to build your game, then we've got plugins there where many of the functions of Beamable, and I'll kind of break that into even more granular detail in a moment, all of those components are just accessible largely through drag and drop, and everything's idiomatic to the 3D engine that you're using. So if you're using Unity, you're working with C Sharp to do customization, for example, or cloud code. If you're working on Unreal, we've got Blueprint support so that you can do a lot of your implementation right at Blueprints before moving to the full server environment that you're going to do. And then the third part is the serverless game backend, which is a container-based technology built around ECS and a lot of Amazon services that actually allows you to do things like the cloud code that I was just explaining. It lets you containerize a lot of your the logic of your game, the rules that govern your game, customize some of the beamable functionality, and it auto scales. So you don't have to you don't have to worry about DevOps ever again, really. Like it's going to scale up to as many users as you're going to have. All right, so John, so you uh, kind of classified those three different layers. Right, that a game developer needs to be aware of or think about when deploying live ops solutions. Um, and Beamable provides a wide variety of features. So can you walk us through what you offer from Beamable? So let's start just from the standpoint of a bunch of the managed services that are built into the product. And I'll, I'll try to relate it back to those three pillars that we were talking about a moment ago. Great. I'll start with inventory because I think it's a good example of, of a lot of these things. So a lot of games have inventory. If you're a live online service game, you almost certainly have inventory in some way, even if you don't call it inventory in your game, you've got some association of the player with the stuff that they have. And that one idea has so many applications across data, analytics, the way you design your game, et cetera. So with inventory, for example, we start at the data layer of the game. So we give you an inventory data model that's very extensible, very expressible. You can customize it to all the specific fields and nuances of your particular game. And we make it really easy to then use these inventory objects in the context of your game. So if you're in Unreal or in Unity, we give you a very simple API that lets you incorporate the idea of inventory into your game without having to code the backend, the data store, all the interfaces that make use of it, and then all of the subsystems that need to relate to it, such as, for example, payments. So if you want to make that an item that someone buys, you don't have to make them items that people buy. It could be just items people pick up in the game. But if you wanted to make a something for sale, for example, that's just a payment interface that works right off of that inventory system. Now, to take it all the way into the quote-unquote quote, live ops, as we were talking about, well, you might want to know things like, well, who has that item? What kind of player is that? You might have a customer service issue. You might want to give someone an item. You might have a leaderboard that ranks people according to how they performed in a particular event. 
If they get a particular leaderboard placement, you might want to give them an item as a reward. You might want to be able to send notifications to players who have had a certain kind of behavior according to their data, event participation, item ownership, et cetera. So the point that I'm getting to here is that while someone could kind of create the very simple concept of owning an item in a game, everybody create everybody who's been in game development has made that at some point. The problem with it is actually making that extensible, scalable to millions of players, and pluggable into all of these other systems that work out of the box. That's really where a lot of complexity lies. And then the third piece of this is then, well, what if you do want to customize that functionality with something or some rule or some trigger that we didn't think of as beamable? That's where a lot of the serverless backend gets involved as well, because using our microservices architecture, which lets you use C-sharp as your programming language, you can now work with the inventory system. You can add capabilities to the inventory system. Examples of that, for example, some really interesting ones. We've actually published some of this in open source. Um, one is you could we've interfaced with generative AI systems. Mm. So for example, you could make your item um, generate art for the item automatically when it's instantiated based on calling out to like a scenario or any, or any of the generative AI systems that are out there. In another case, we even added another layer to that, which is uh, we, we published this little open source project called Genomon. It uses generative AI to create card art for for these creatures that you're collecting in the game and then we showed how within like five minutes you could also publish that to a blockchain with web3 so mm. you may not care about generative ai you may not care about blockchain at all the point of this is when you have a flexible adaptable inventory system that's customizable through c-sharp microservices that's mm. got off the shelf systems for leaderboards, events, analytics, et cetera. Now you have all of this creativity that you can express because these systems are so easy to add and customize very readily instead of some backend programmers spending months of work on something that they really don't want to work on because they probably would prefer to build a game system or a feature. Right. Uh, and then you know, accumulating the technical debt along the way and you find out you can't adapt it yeah. to your actual needs. Yeah, so what I think is wonderful about the extensibility of this, right? We're really talking about undifferentiated systems, right? Like the inventory system that a game developer may spend time trying to develop isn't what's going to differentiate their game to the player, right? Because those are the, that's kind of all of the, the fitting and management and interconnectivity that happens in the back and that the player never sees, right? So you are, so Beamable, is making those kind of, again, undifferentiated services, flexible, integrated, and extensible to fit basically anybody's notion of what an inventory system, right, as one example, uh, could be. And what I also, something that you uh, triggered in, in my brain here was, it's not just about the inventory of the items I've gathered in the game, it's all of the information in totality about that player. It could be achievements, it could be, you know, the, uh, again, the, the trading components that are happening back and forth. It could be items that are accrued outside of the game or even through other mechanisms that, that are brought in. Um, and so I think that's wonderful that Beamable makes it extensible enough to fit into all of these, you know, massively variety of use cases that a game developer may bring uh, to bear in the game that they're creating. That, that's right. Too many game developers but have become basically full-time middleware developers. And, and that's unfortunate because it's just not a good use of your time. It yeah. gets complicated. And then every time you have to add a feature, you're back to the middleware. So we don't think of ourselves as middleware. We, we essentially think of ourselves as removing middleware as a requirement for building these systems. Yeah. And that's by giving you the SDK, giving you the integrated live ops tools, which is and user functionality for your team and you know everything to to customize and customization is a big part of it because the earliest wave of products that you know call it back end as a service or live services there's a bunch of names people have used for this stuff mm -hmm. the first wave of it were basically just APIs that you could call 
and they were highly opinionated. And if you just do exactly what they give you, then they might work fine, but you were also constrained by it. They're kind of black box APIs that mm -hmm. couldn't really be customized to your specific use cases. And we saw that both at my studio Disruptor Beam, because we tried to work with some of these things. Um, and we certainly saw it as a software company here at Beamable, which is you can't just give people APIs you have to give them the ability to customize. And yeah. that's where building this whole microservices architecture, which is you know, both the ability to give your own custom server logic, your own server authoritative logic to your game, but also the ability to customize a lot yeah. of the systems or build off the inventory system that we've got. Yeah. And that's kind of like, we're just taking a cue from 3D engines and what made them successful. Like, 3D engines, when they started to add scriptability, customizability, simplified workflow, extensibility through marketplaces of plugins that would just work off the shelf, that's what made 3D engines work. And that's what we're bringing to this world of live ops, DevOps, et cetera. Excellent. And you know, when you talk about interfacing with uh, new kind of experimental or exploratory systems like generative AI. Sounds like this is a wonderful opportunity to see how this works with something like Amazon Bedrock, right? Which provides a simple API and for integration there. So, you know, developers can actually go there and play around with a bunch of different foundation models and um, different systems provided by, you know, a variety uh, of customers. So really going to be interesting to see how we can do some integration there together. Yeah, it really future proofs your technology architecture, because instead of something like bedrock being something that now you have to go back to your back end team and have a million conversations and convince people that it's worth doing. And before you know it, you've had all these annoying all hands meetings just to decide to even try it. Well, now just some programmer can sit down one day with Beamable and just say, Hey, I'm just going to try this and see how it works in the context of a microservice mm -hmm. in, you know, invoke a generative AI call into my inventory system and you could show it off in a demo probably that day instead yeah. of all this complexity and it'll scale. It'll yeah. scale because it's built on a container architecture on ECS and listen, like as far as I know, Amazon will handle as many users as can possibly come at your game. And we built around that architecture so that you know that the, you know, that the service level will be there behind however many people come to the game. Excellent. Yeah, look, doing work that allows us to go in and get the technology out of the way so developers can just build more, bigger, better, connected games, art, and story, right? That's the goal. Yeah. All right, John, you got me interested. All right, I'm a game developer and I, and I want to go ahead and start using Beamable. So what's, how do I do that? What's my first step? Um, well, the good news is that it's really easy to do. You, you don't have to do a whole lot. You can just go to our website and you can immediately sign up and everything I've described is immediately available to you. You download an SDK for the 3D engine that you like to use, the live ops, every, everything's right there. There's not even any software to install anywhere on the back end. There's also the ability to do what we call private cloud. You can fill out a form on our website for that. And that allows you to actually deploy it on your own AWS infrastructure. Then you'll have source code and root access and all the stuff that you could ever ask for there, but you don't need to go to that if you just want to try it out. Just go to beamable.com, sign up right on the site. Yeah, and you can try it for free, like we see right here, for up to 100,000 API calls, right? Yeah, it's try for free. Like we just want everybody to be able to try it out. You don't need to talk to us. I mean, literally in the first few minutes, you'll be on the website, you'll be trying out the live ops portal, you can download the SDK, plug it into Unreal, plug it into Unity, and away you go. All right, so if I'm plugging into these engines, I want to start building those microservices, like, how, how, how do I get started? You know, um, maybe you can walk us through a little bit of that. Sure. So it's it's worth noting that a lot of the capabilities that I described, like adding inventory, adding events, a lot of these things to your game, that doesn't require you to ever touch a line of C-sharp code. That's just 
kind of a drag and drop operation for the most part. But if you want to get into customization, if you want to write your own cloud code for server authoritative logic in your game, that's where all of the extensibility and customization of Beamable comes in. There's a couple of things I just do want to add to C-sharp microservices because some people don't immediately realize how powerful the system is. But in addition to coding in C-sharp to add all of this logic, it's, it's worth noting that it really simplifies debugging for your game. Why is that? So number one, we instantiate all of the server-based components of your game architecture locally on the developer's workstation. So if they've got server logic that they're testing that they need to be able to work with in the process of development, we're using container technologies. So it's all there. They don't have to like have this weird tapestry of outside servers that they're interacting with. And then it makes the whole DevOps process super complicated. No, they're going to be able right. to reuse it locally. But what's the second piece that that means? Well, we've made it easy to debug as well. So on this screen, for example, we're showing how you can actually have your C-sharp code in Unity in the front end next to the C-sharp code on the server. It's full stack transparency into everything that's happening in your game. So you could set a breakpoint, for example, or a watch variable on the server, but initiate that and step through it from the client code. So no more of this nightmare of like multiple IDEs and your testing pieces separately. That's just a mess. I, I don't know any developer who really likes that when it comes to time to debug anything. So this makes it super easy. It's idiomatic and very powerful, but the whole net of this is it increases your velocity. You are rapidly prototyping new ideas quickly. And when you wanna test it in a live environment with other people, super easy to progress it through the process of, of DevOps into production. Very cool. Okay. So John, maybe walk us through some of the solutions that actually, let me ask you a question. Are these solutions that you have built that you make available? This is part of the viewable stack, right? Yes. These okay. are all okay. off the shelf. Okay. okay. All right. All right, so John, so you're making it easier to basically do that kind of integration work directly from inside of the engine. You can use C Sharp to go ahead and, and modify and customize things. Um, you can also be as hands-off as you wanna be just using the base solutions and, and uh, components that Beamable offers. Tell us more about some of the solutions that Beamable provides to game developers. So to, just to crystallize things a little bit more, I'll, I'll take us through a few use cases. And these are all things that are just like immediately available. You don't have to build anything for these. These would be just added to your game by using Beamable. So first of all, I commented on DevOps a little bit. We let you structure all of the runtime environments, all the developers who contribute, all the staging and testing environments, your various production environments. If there's more than one, we handle that. And you can kind of create the schema of how code content data flows through that process. We give you the ability to kind of visually structure it, but more importantly, you can initiate that process both from the developer workstation as, through, as well as the live ops portal. And it's, and it's managed in a holistic packaged way, right? So when the inventory schema changes, it moves along with the code changes. So mm -hmm. again, no hodgepodge of brutal scripts to figure yeah. out how to make that happen. And usually it means like a developer is like doing all this black magic that you don't want to know about behind the scenes. We, we get rid of all of that. So that's one. Another well, is- I was just going to say, so in that case too, when we're talking about a distributed uh, development team, everybody's working from the same code base. Everybody's working from the same build. Everybody's working with the same set of stuff. So you basically, you, you eliminate a lot of that uncertainty that can happen when you don't have uh, you know, kind of a complete backend and serviced solution like this. Yeah, exactly. So, and people, but people might be working on different pieces at the same time, of course, if you've got 
multiple developers or a distributed development team. So for example, a microservice can be built, tested locally alongside of all of its other dependencies on your developer workstation. And then when you want QA to test that, you can promote that microservice into mm -hmm. another, what we call realm, people can test it there. And then when that's ready to go live, you can push another button and it promotes it into the production environment. So Very it's cool. all over the wire. You don't, you don't have to like run scripts in your Linux shell and all, and all this other stuff just to get it to work. And then you're constantly just fixing those scripts. So yes, it makes it very easy for these teams to collaborate with each other. Wonderful. All right. So what else? What's next? So integrated analytics and, and we just give you off the shelf a lot of the essential KPIs that most game developers are going to use. But I think more importantly, it's built around these services, right? So when you use our player inventory, when you use um, the purchasing modules that we give you, the event system, the leaderboards, a lot of these stock components, they're already instrumented with best practices analytics for a lot of the things that you're going to need as a game developer to track things like per you know, purchases, ARP DAO, DAU, retention, et cetera. It's also extensible. So you don't have to, we also don't think of ourselves as like the ultimate in data science. We think you're going to add other data science modules to your architecture. So we have the ability to forward data to other analytics platforms like that. If you want to take these pre-instrumented modules and channel it into other systems that give you even more intelligence around how you're doing that. Very cool. Yeah. More data we can give developers about how people are playing, where breakpoints are the better the games can be and the, the smoother the operation of those those games are going to be. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. And then content scheduling is another, this is actually just another example of how when you've got things like events, offers and bundlings for your items or messaging campaigns, these are all examples of content that's going to make it into your game. But in Beamable, a lot of these systems work with each other. An example of that would be our content scheduling system. So maybe you've figured out that an event is going to launch you know, next weekend. At the same exact time, you need to be sure that the new offers and bundles for the items you're going to be selling in that game are there. And you might also want to shoot off a set of messages to your players, mm -hmm. or you might even want to target messages to certain kind of players. Like maybe you want to target people who've reached a certain level in the game, for example. So all of that is existing is examples of content. Well, you might want to schedule that. You might not want to have like three or four or five different systems individually with some kind of product manager behind the scenes, kind of <laughs> pressing all the buttons to make it work and have and hoping that nothing goes wrong. No, it's it's part of an integrated content scheduling system. Again, visual, you tell it what dates, you associate what content is going to go live on that date, and it just happens. So that that's another example of like the use cases of what, what can occur when you have a consistent data system, interoperability between modules, and, and everything working harmoniously. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Yeah. So let's go on to commerce. So I'm assuming, you know, all right, we've got, you know, code being developed. You've got uh, the analytics about how people are playing and, you know, what they're collecting or so on and so forth. You have content that you schedule um, and you may want to conduct some sort of transaction against all of that data, all of those objects, player activities. Talk to us about your commerce control. Well, we could, we could, also commented even what does commerce mean at a basic level it means being able to sell stuff i suppose so we offer payment modules so you can charge for content and do in-app purchases across all of the popular platforms that that you're going to use for that but it isn't just payment it's also okay now we're selling stuff to people a customer service person has to be able to log in and fix an issue grant an item to someone look at the purchase history resolve problems a qa person needs to be able to do similar things just in the context of testing things. The product manager needs to be able to bundle items together and create new offerings and learn from the way people are purchasing things. So yeah, and it is this holistic approach to these systems, which is that they operate off of a common data system with live ops tools to make it easy to use. And then the developer tools that let you bring that content and components into your game. 
messaging just, I mean, is just another extension of that. Like I, I kind of touched on it a little bit when I was talking about content scheduling, but messaging is a system that doesn't exist in a vacuum. Messaging works with the analytics, the player histories and whatnot. So you could target messages to your players through both in-game messaging, as well as like notifications through your game that are based on attributes or various cohorts that you've established according to the way you think about your players, including, you know, any number of custom fields that you come up with. We talked about the C-sharp code, but like, it's also worth noting that you can see through the live ops dashboards, like has the most recent microservice that your developers have created? Has that made it into live? What is the resource utilization? Is, you know, being friendly from a, if you write your own code, you're going to want to know, is it being friendly from like a memory and a resource utilization standpoint? We give you transparency Mm -hmm. into all of that. You can back out microservices if something did in fact have a problem at any point in the production process. So we, we try to think of these systems as all working together in an integrated fashion to spare developers the problem of trying to interconnect all these systems and do ETLs and translations and custom dashboards. That stuff is just, frankly, it's just a big waste of time for a game developer who needs to work on the things players care about, which is cool content, cool features, new idea in the game. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to pause just one second. Let me ask you a quick question about uh, player support messaging. Can I take those, um, can I take all of that data and export it to do analytics on that for toxicity and things like that from your messaging module or no? Uh, well, you could, all the data ex- is exportable and beamable, and you could even just drop stuff into an S3 bucket and look at it. So okay. all right. yes, do we have toxicity a, a management analysis tool? tools? No, no, not yet. But you could okay. use those tools off of the data very easily. Okay, all right. Yeah, since we don't have it in there, we won't con- confuse it, right? We'll just continue to to go. Okay, and then we're going to talk about, um, uh, now we're going to jump back over to the marketplace slide, right? And say, um, okay, here we go. All right, John, so these are great examples of how a game developer can use Beamable today to solve these critical development, management, live ops, and and customer, right, uh, uh, opportunities, not problems, they're opportunities, right? But you also have a marketplace that Beamable integrates uh, with. So can you tell us about the Beamable marketplace? So we know that we can't build everything back end that game developers are ever going to dream of. And we decided that we should make it A, accessible to other third-party developers who just want to add to our capability, but also even just within individual game publishers, you may want to create your own modules that you share either in your studio or across a constellation of studios if you're a publisher. But why are we able to do that? It's not just a list of links that you can download some code. It's the fact that we have an architecture for data that provides the interoperability of many of the things we've talked about. So inventories and players and analytics, all of that stuff becomes standardized within Beamable so that you can now actually create plugin modules that add to those capabilities without all the ETLs and the scripting and the conversions and et cetera that you'd normally have to do. And because we've got the C-sharp microservices architecture, it also lets plugin developers create this backend code that's auto-scalable, that works with these interfaces faces that flows through the packaging and DevOps processes that we've talked about. Basically, we've solved a lot of the problems with the ability to share and make use of innovations in the back end, whether you're an individual developer or uh, someone who wants to make code to sell to other game developers. And, and this slide is just an example of some of the first people who have created some of that you can see that we've attracted a bunch of people from the generative AI space who are trying to automate and federate the gen AI process into say an inventory system. We've had web three people, we've had analytics people. So we've had real time networking, 
you know, so there's a lot of capabilities there and and we actually just want to invite everybody in to do it. Even if, even if we've thought of something, frankly, like if someone had a better, I don't know, um, leaderboard system and beamable, we'd be like, heck, like go, go for it. Like contribute a, a better leaderboard plugin to beamable because really our value is that data architecture, the integrated stuff, the fact that we make life easy. We're not, particularly precious about like individual modules and capabilities. We're going to, we're just going to make a really big tent for everyone to make life easier for game developers. Excellent. So again, getting those undifferentiated features kind of integrated on the back end, providing multiple pathways for a developer to utilize this, bring it into engine integration, providing all these addi additional services that make it easier to manage their customer base, their content, their transactions, and extending out to third-party solutions that integrate easily into Beamable really provides an incredible foundation for any game developer looking to go ahead and operate a live op service. That's right, off-the-shelf capabilities, customization, automated scalability. So John, can you share with us about some customers that are currently using Beamable today? We're a young company, but we've been super lucky already. About 40 games have launched on the platform and it comprises, you know, millions and millions of users at this point of activity. But you can see from the side here, some of these are, are some you know, well-esteemed game developers in the field. And, but like we're shipping this, this slide is changing so much all the time at this point, like every, every week we're adding one or two, there's, there's hundreds of games in the pipeline. There's at least 200 games that we're going to see published on Beamable over the next couple of years. So it's growing super rapidly, which is good because that lets us also see the patterns amongst game developers and, and what kind of problems they need to really solve and get ahead of them. Fantastic. Yeah. So for any game developer uh, looking to uh, build games that may fit into those genres or platforms, here's a collection of a uh, selection of customers that are currently using Beamable today. And you can go check out their uh, the games that they're operating today as well. All right, John, all of this sounds fantastic. So I want you to walk us through the Beamable website. So what developers can expect when they go visit Beamable.com. And uh, I want your kind of tips and tricks for, uh, you know, for where I would want to go ahead and focus on if I'm first time, you know, uh, user or visitor to the site and I want to get started on Beamable. So here we are on the website. Walk us through it. So we have a mantra as a company. It's we fight for the game maker. Meaning I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So the the whole idea is is we're we're totally about the developer. It's total transparency of everything. So first of all, pricing. If you want to know what we cost, there's no mysteries. You don't have to you don't have to like talk to the sales guy. All the pricing is up there. It's free to use to get started uh, up to 100,000 API calls. It's just free. Most developers are not going to have any problem staying under that. Once you start getting into soft launch, you'll have some very nominal costs. There's also what we call the private cloud option. You can do private cloud, and then you'll actually be running on AWS infrastructure of your own. So that's an option too for people who want source code or think they can optimize their pricing a little bit more when the infrastructure is actually under their direct control. But all the pricing is up there. Another thing that I just point out is that you can sign up for Beamable on the website. So you click, literally just click that sign up button. You'll have a form and about one minute later or less than a minute later, depending on how you fast you type, you'll be in the portal. You'll you'll be playing with Beamable at that point. Um, but also all the documentation is up as well. So you can, all these features that we were talking about, all the API calls, It's it's got lots and lots of information on there. We've got sample projects. We've got developers explaining how to do things in like YouTube videos. We've got GitHub projects you can download. So again, transparency, we fight for the game maker. It's all up there. You don't need to like, what you know wonder what the capabilities are and then 
you know, six or 12 months later, you finally get to take a look at what it really does. It's up there now. You can download it and you can learn how to use it. It's, it's all up on our website. And if you need help, you know, we have support programs that you can join us in Slack channels and Discord channels, and we can set you up with our support engineers and they'll answer any questions that you've got. That's fantastic. I also noticed you, know, you had the community section there. So that's your Discord channel and other developers helping each other out, answering questions and kind of it's a bit of the game developer ethos, right? That even though we all work for different companies, we're all game makers first, right? Game developers first. And so people lean in to help each other through those communities. And it's great to see that you have those uh, those mechanisms available for anybody that is getting started on Beamable or want to contribute back to that community. Uh, exactly. It, it's part of the thinking behind the whole marketplace idea to just even return to that for a moment, which is every game developer has some kind of cool thing that they've invented internally. And if it's back end, we want to unlock that for the community. So the idea of having a marketplace with these standardized interfaces, you could publish that in a GitHub and we're we're super happy to share that with anybody and make that something that that you could give back to the community as well if you wanted to. Like I said, we don't, we're not precious about individual features. Like, like we think we have a good matchmaking system, for example. But if you've got special logic for matchmaking that's hyper specific to your game, and you want to make a microservice that either um, amends or, if you need to, completely replaces it, like it's there for the community to use. All right, John, so as we wrap up here today, let's go ahead and hit the three major beats, right? The three things we want any developer to know about Beamable and getting started with Beamable today. So what would those be? So the most important thing for any game developer is to just increase your velocity, iteration, get to market faster. And then when you're out in front of customers, make sure that you can continue to delight people as quickly as you can. So that means that you shouldn't be building a bunch of undifferentiated features. That's what we give you right off of the shelf. Right, so, and so Beamable integrates all those things so you don't have to and helps get that, that very complex technology out of the way so you can just focus on building better games. All right, number two would be what? I'd say the extensibility of the product. So yes, we give you a lot of things that you can do right out of the gate, but you may in fact decide that there's 10 or 20% that you still do need to customize or change. That's where the way we've built Beamable really comes in. It's the ability to customize with C-sharp microservices or just look on the marketplace first, see if someone else has already figured it out and pull that in. So we really believe in customization and adapting to things over time. You don't have to just work with a bunch of black box services. It's there to actually act as a developer platform, not just developer tools, but a platform, meaning that you can change it and evolve it to your needs over time. Great. So integrated with uh, the different development environments that a game developer would want to go to and use, highly extensible to make it as flexible as you need, and already integrated with other third-party services that continues to grow in the Beamable marketplace. That's a fantastic number two. And I think the third one, right, one of the big ones, right, on everybody's mind is price. You know, what is it going to cost for me to get started? It's free to start. So what what's holding you back? Just go to our website and sign up. Very easy to use. Very easy to learn. The workflow is something that delights every game developer who's tried it. So give it a try. Excellent, excellent. So I want to thank again our guest, John Radoff, the co-founder and CEO of Beamable. There are links to all of the components that we talked about in today's video at the end of the video. So make sure you go ahead and check it out. John, thank you so much for spending time with us today, man. And thank you for running on AWS. Um, we love being a partner of yours and we're happy to work together to help game developers bring their games to the world and just build more better art, more connection, more smiles. And uh, I think, you know, together we can help game developers do just that. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks for being a great partner and a great infrastructure to build on.